So today I'm going to speak to you about the supernatural secret of succession. And if we look here at the word of God, the supernatural secret of succession is revealed in 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2 was written to establish the qualification for exaltation into spiritual succession. In other words, who's going to receive the mantle? The text was written in order to demonstrate the mandate for ministry and what is required to inherit the mantle. How many people here want to inherit a mantle? I'll never forget when I was very, very young. I was in my 20s. It was before I founded Breath of the Spirit Ministry, so I must have been around 22, 23. I can remember laying on the floor. I can remember crying my eyes out with the book of Catherine Kuhlman after she had gone to glory. And I can remember begging Jesus. I can remember saying, Jesus, I'll pay any price. I'll do anything you want me to do. But please let the anointing that we felt in the days of Catherine Kuhlman never leave the body of Christ. Let them stay with us. Amen. The entire purpose of 2 Kings chapter 2 is to demonstrate the price of one's power and the anointing of God on one's life. The landscape of 2 Kings chapter 2 is written in a way unlike any other text in Scripture. It is written, dear people of God, the only other place that actually has a type of a similar landscape is found in 2 Kings chapter 4 when we look at the Shunammite woman. And the only thing in common with 2 Kings 2 and 2 Kings 4 is that the Shunammite woman says the very same thing that Elisha says to Elijah. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 30 says, as the Lord liveth and thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So somehow we are seeing a formation of a doctrine of theology, a theology of the Holy Spirit, a theology of legacy, a theology of anointing that actually begins in 2 Kings chapter 2. And we see that same theme perpetuated in 2 Kings chapter 4 through the widow who had nothing in her house but a pot of oil and then later in 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8 the Shunammite so there is something about 2 Kings chapter 2 that introduces us to the supernatural secret of succession there is something in 2 Kings chapter 2 that teaches us how to inherit the mantle and how to inherit legacy Elisha had a constant response that was, and we see it in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 4, and 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 6. And that was the response, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So we understand that we see this not only in 2 Kings chapter 4, the Shunammite's response to Elisha uh, when Elisha is about to raise her son from the dead, but we see that Elisha's influence was upon that Shunammite, and this is why she gave the same response that Elisha gave to Elijah, and it is mentioned three times in the text. 2 Kings chapter 2 was written to bring the shocking surprise. Touch your neighbor and say, are you willing to be shocked right now? 2 Kings chapter 2 was written to bring the shocking surprise to show heaven's divine election, hallelujah, and also heaven's divine rejection of those who would aspire to greatness but did not make it. I hope somebody understands what I'm talking about. Say this with me right now. In the name of Jesus, Father God, I want to be one of those that that you will use in this hour. And Father, I ask that my life would reflect divine election and not rejection. I want my heart to be right with God and I want to serve God under the anointing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I get a witness somewhere? All right. What do we mean when we say the text is written specifically to show two kinds of people, the divine election and also 
God's rejection of those who are either going to receive the mantle or not going to receive the mantle. Touch your neighbor and say, I want to be one of those that are going to receive the mantle. All right. Here we see in the word of God that the text here is written in 2 Kings chapter 2 to convey the concept through the sons of the prophets. The sons of the prophets were very self-assured. The sons of the prophets feel as if they have a spiritual superiority over Elisha. All right? They do not know who Elisha is. Yes, they know Elisha is taking care of Elijah. Yes, they know very well that Elisha follows Elisha wherever he goes. Yes, they know very well that Elisha will never leave Elijah. But they have a, ter a, a tremendous misinterpretation to the identity of who Elisha actually is. Because of Elisha's humility and because Elisha spends his life protecting and respecting the anointing, they absolutely do not know who Elisha is and they speak very, um, very demeaning to Elisha and they themselves have a spiritual superiority, superiority because they do not perceive him as a powerful person in God. This is because of Elisha's deliberate attempt to be radically humble. All right, touch your neighbor and say, are you radically humble? To be radically humble and not to be seen of men and to be a servant of servants to the man of God. If we look at the scriptures, let's look at the way the landscape of the text has laid this whole thing out for us. Second Kings chapter 2. We're going to see that the scripture is going to deliberately develop a landscape here in the text to show us two kinds of people. The Bible says here, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said, do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? And he said, Elisha said, yea, I know it. Hold thy peace. And again, we see the same thing repeated as if Elisha didn't know. And notice the language they're using. Notice they didn't say, did you know? that the Lord is going to take away our master from our head today because Elijah was the teacher of all of the prophets. But now we're seeing that this superior sect of prophets in the group have some type of a misunderstanding as to who Elisha is because they misinterpret his radical humility. They misinterpret the fact that he takes care of the man of God and pours water over his hands and makes sure that he is taken care care of. They don't understand that spiritual succession comes through protecting and respecting the anointing. Can I get a witness somewhere? And here we see that Elisha said unto them, I know it, hold your peace. So here we go again in verse 5. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho. Notice the first time the Bible is saying the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel. Now we have a distance away from Bethel, um, many, many miles away from Bethel, which is a place called Jericho. All right. And the Bible says the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said the very same thing. Do you not know that the Lord is going to take away your master from your head today? Well, first of all, this should be, every person that reads this should find this a little strange. Why? Because the sons of the prophets, Elijah was their master also. But they did not consider Elijah their spiritual father. They now consider themselves on the same level as Elijah. I can't get any help in here. Somebody ought to say today, Holy Ghost, keep me in that place of being teachable. Because if I'm teachable, I'm reachable. Can I get a witness somewhere? Okay, so here we see that Elisha said unto him, know ye not, um, and, and he said, I know it, hold, my pe hold your peace. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said, they said the same thing, and they, and he responded, they responded the same way, and he said, I know it, hold your peace. 
The Bible has done this deliberately on purpose to show us that there are two different groups of prophets. Some that spoke to uh, Elisha, not perceiving his place and not perceiving his power. And they had no idea that his radical lifestyle of protecting and respecting the anointing was going to make him a candidate that qualifies for the mantle because the sons of the prophets are not going to receive the mantle. It is going to be Elisha that receives the mantle of Elijah. Can I get a witness somewhere? <laughs> see, we see in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says in the middle of that verse, as, the, as your soul lives and as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. We see it again in verse 5. As the Lord lives and your, uh, in verse 6, as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so we see it again in verse, in verse 4, as, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So here we see it in verse 2, verse 4, and verse 6. There is a continuity in the context that shows us that Elisha is not going to leave Elijah until Elijah is out of this earth. He has pledged fidelity to the man of God and to the anointing to take care of that anointing as long as he is on the earth. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 11. Um, we see that his actual identity, which was very unusual for a prophet, they said, is there someone who can direct us? The three kings were saying, is there someone that can direct us to tell us what's going to happen in this war? And, and Jehoshaphat says, there is one here. And the Bible says, there is Elisha who poured water on the hands of Elijah. So we see that Elisha was a man who who lived in legacy and poured water on the hands of the man of God. These things are written to demonstrate the credentials of a calling. This is clearly contrasted in the text between those who want title and position and those who really want to transition to the next level. Put your hand up and say, I'm not really interested in title and position, but I really am interested that God would put his anointing on me that I might transition to the next level. Can I get a witness somewhere? <laughs> Hallelujah. So we see this, this, this clashing contrast between Elisha, and the sons of the prophets. We also see a second mandate for ministry that shows us the second supernatural secret of succession. The first one is protecting and respecting the anointing. This first one is being faithful unto death, staying in your place, staying in your position, not doing it to be seen of men, but even, and, and to have an identity of a servant. That means Elisha really didn't have an identity as of a prophet until that mantle came upon him. All right. His identity was just the identity of a servant taking care of the man of God. Can I get a witness somewhere? The second mandate for ministry, as we see, and the supernatural secret of succession, is shown to us also here in 2 Kings chapter 2, which shows us how God uses resistance in order to deposit persistence in our lives, because persistence really is the price of one's power. Say this with me. Persistence is the price of one's power. All right. The text is going to give insight into an unusual training technique that Elijah is going to use on Elijah. Elisha. It is a very unusual training technique that actually is a, a training technique that is Using resistance. You know how when a person is working out and a person is training, they have to lift weights because that resistance is going to build muscle. Well, in a spiritual sense, the prophet Elijah is going to use resistance 
to train Elisha for next level ministry. That, that's the same way the Holy Spirit trains many of us to go up to the next level. He teaches us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He teaches us through hardships. And he said to Timothy to bear your share of the hardship of what the gospel entails. Can I get a witness? Touch your neighbor and say if you really want the mantle. Read what the word says. So here we see this unusual training technique, which we see was used by Elijah in order to produce the quality of divine determination that is needed for every person that has any type of le legitimate ministry at all. Without divine determination, there can be no exaltation into greatness. And Elijah knew that the personality profile of Elisha was a passive personality profile. And as a master instructor in the things of God, he's going to have to do something with that passive personality profile that it's great. God doesn't take away our personality. He certainly doesn't. But there are some times that there are issues in our personality or traits in our personality that God uses and some that God refuses. In this case, we're going to see in the beginning of his ministerial career, Elisha was tested with resistance, but did not understand that the mantle has to be, um, has to be pursued with persistence. Put your hand up and say, I understand that the mantle has to be pursued with persistence. You see, Elisha was after the mantle. Okay, he wasn't after a man. He was after the mantle. He realized that there was something in the mantle of Elisha. The reason why I wanted to study Catherine Kuhlman for so long, and while she was alive, I followed her the way I did. And even after her death, why I pursued her teachings more is I was after, not after a person. I was after the power. I was after the mantle. I wanted that mantle. Can I get a witness somewhere? You have to be able to see a mantle and say, God, I want that mantle. I want a mantle of fire on my life like that. Here's what the Bible shows us in the beginning of the ministerial career of Elisha. The Bible says, so he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, plowing with 12 yoke of oxen um, that was before him. And he was with the 12. And the Bible says, last line of 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, and he cast his mantle on him. And the Bible says, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and he said, let me, I pray thee, first kiss my mother and father, then I will follow thee. Now watch the last line of verse 20. And Elijah said to him, go back. What have I done unto thee? He was ready to revoke the mantle. Now you're going to understand something. In biblical times, when somebody goes to kiss their mother and father, it doesn't mean to go embrace them and just say, goodbye, mom, goodbye, father. I'm going to go follow the prophet Elijah. God's calling me. That's not what that means. In biblical times, when someone said, first, let me go and kiss my mother and father, it's like saying, first, let me go bury my mother and father. Now, and that's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 9, let the dead bury the dead. He didn't mean not to have compassion on the dead. My goodness, that is a hesed. That is something that, that is commendable in the scripture. A person that buries the dead is one of the highest forms of, of, of compassion and mercy. Someone who, who comforts those who are grieving. How much more for one's parents? That is not what that means. But in biblical times, when one person said, let me first bury my mother and father, or let me just stay, it meant my father might be 40 years old now. He might die when he's 70. I'm going to stay with my mother and father until they pass away. All right? So that was the actual norm. So they didn't have to be sick. They didn't have to be... They didn't have to be infir infirmed in any way. It just meant, I can't answer the call of God now. I felt the anointing, but I can't answer the call of God. And Elijah said to Elisha, 
get back. What have I done unto thee? So we see it as a type of training technique that Elijah used on Elisha to produce persistence in him. He used resistance to produce persistence. And that's what the Holy Ghost does. He allows us to go through trials and tribulations. He allows us to be disappointed at times. He allows us to go through difficult days. He allows us to feel like throwing in the towel and saying, God, I don't think I can take this ministry another day because what he is actually doing is he is forming in us a supernatural training technique and he is using supernatural resistance to produce persistence in all of us can I get a witness somewhere and we actually see beloved saints we actually see that this is actually such a powerful training technique when he said go back because right after that um, Elijah sna Elisha snapped to it he didn't say okay see you later no he didn't say that he realized that he had a problem with that yoke of oxen so do you know what he did he really couldn't break away from his oxen it wasn't really that he wanted to bury his mother and his father there was an attachment to the yoke of oxen because Elisha was a very well-to-do man it's very unheard of for somebody to have 12 yoke of oxen that many had 24 yoke of oxen that's a complete herd that means he was a man of great means but in order to follow Elisha Elijah he had to kind of break away from that for a season and go and follow the man of God and do what God told him to do. And the Bible says he went back, he broke the yoke of oxen, he boiled it, he sat down, he gave people something to eat, and he went after Elijah and he ministered unto him. Now the question is, through all the resistance that you have gone through to stay in God's house. I want you to know, I know there's not one person sitting here in this audience today that is consecrating for another year of ministry that hasn't gone through some form of resistance, that hasn't gone through some form of spiritual battle, that the Holy Spirit is now going to use that resistance and what is going to make you great in the kingdom is to press past the resistance and be faithful in Holy Ghost persistence to do what God has called you to do. So we see in 2 Kings chapter 2, we see Elijah using the same tech training technique that he used for him many years earlier. Many years earlier, he said, go back. What do I have to do with you? And now on the last days of Elijah's, Elijah's life, he says, go back. He said, go back. And he said uh, very, very clearly, he tells him, go back. And he does not go back. He said, go back because the Lord's called me to Bethel. He said it when he was leaving Gilgal. And then he said it again, go back because the Lord has called me to, to Jericho. And then he said, go back because the Lord has called me to Jordan. So I want you to understand that in every place, every single place that the prophet Elijah walked, he told Elisha to go back. Do you know why? Right before you get the mantle, right before there is a breakthrough, please hear the word of the Lord. Right before something happens in your life that the desire of your heart is for God, right before the doors of destiny open in your life, you need to know very, very clearly that there's going to be a little voice that says, go back. There's going to be a voice that says, stop right here. But if you allow that divine resistance to push you into that that uh, resistance to push you into divine persistence you will receive the mantle can i get a witness somewhere there will be voices that will say to you there will be voices that will say to you very clearly to to give it up there will be voices that will say to you go back 
There will be voices that will say to you, what are you doing here? There will be voices that will say, you really should have gone back a long time ago. Don't go to the next level. Don't go to the next city. Don't go to the next place. But Elisha's response was consistent. He said, as the Lord lives and as my soul lives, I will not leave you. All right. And what was the desire of his heart? They came, they crossed the Jordan. All right. And now Elijah, Elijah says to Elijah, tell me, what is it that you want me to do for you before I'm taken away from you? And he says, a double portion of your anointing. My prayer is that a double portion of your anointing will rest upon me. Now, beloved people, I want you to understand something that is so important. His desire was to be used of God. His desire was ministry. His desire was to take the anointing up to another level. And I want you to know that as soon as he made that prayer, he was already tested right before the prayer. And the testing was stay back. The testing was go back. Just let your, yet let your guard down just a little bit but if he had not pressed his way in persistence when the moment came for the doors of destiny he would have never gotten to Jordan to that place for the mantle to fall from heaven touch your neighbor and say neighbor do yourself a favor be faithful unto death because right around the corner if you are being tested to go back, that means that your Jordan is right around the corner. Can I get a witness somewhere? Somebody ought to shout. Somebody ought to give God the praise and give God the glory in this house. Jesus said, be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Being faithful unto death doesn't just mean standing in front of a firing squad. Being faithful unto death doesn't just mean trying to pass those Bibles through the customs of, of the Chinese mainland. Being faithful unto death doesn't mean risking your life for somebody else. Could, but there's more meaning than that. Being faithful unto death is doing something you don't want to do. Being faithful unto death is going when you don't feel like going. Being faithful unto death is sitting there when you don't get any praise and you've worked so hard and everybody around you has, has kind of not paid attention to you and you're going through something, but you're giving something to somebody else. Being faithful unto death is dying a thousand deaths and giving your will to the Holy Ghost and saying, God, not my will, but thine be done. Can I get a witness somewhere? Somebody ought to shout the victory in this place. Let us raise our hands right now toward heaven and let us just ask the Lord right now for his mercy and for his glorious power, for his presence. Holy Spirit of God, right now, we want to.